welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge. Hello, I'm Mindy Silva. Welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge Highlights Reel. Today I have Ann Johnston from the North of Ireland Family History Society. I was also hoping to have Donna Bowman, who is the challenge captain, but she's traveling. Uh, Donna's also a project coordinator within the Disasters Project, and she's involved in the One, one Place Study Project and the Cemeteries Project. So welcome, Anne. Thank you yeah. very much indeed. I'm going to talk a little bit about Wikitree. First, for those viewers that don't know who we are, for those people, our mission is to grow one accurate shared tree that connects us all and is accessible to everyone free forever. It's all about collaboration. There's one profile for a person. If you and I share an ancestor, we work on that profile together. It's not that you have your tree and I have my tree. It's all one big tree. And did I mention it's all free? We just passed the 33 million profile milestone with almost 11 million of those having DNA connections attached to them. What really makes Wikitree work is its community. And a cornerstone of the community is our honor code. Anyone can view profiles on Wikitree, but to edit more than close family member profiles, you have to sign the honor code. It emphasizes sourcing, giving credit, courtesy, understanding, accessibility, accuracy, and respecting privacy. Privacy is another aspect of Wikitree that makes it special. Even though we're growing a one world tree and we all collaborate, only close family members collaborate on modern family profiles. As you go back in time, the profile uh, privacy controls open up. Collaboration on deep ancestors is between distant cousins who are serious about genealogical research, careful about sources, and willing to see their research validated or invalidated with DNA. So if you aren't a member yet, come and join us. It just takes a minute to register as a guest member, and you can delete a guest account at any time. Now for this challenge, we have partnered with the North of Ireland Family History Center or Society, and boy, did we have a lot of fun with it. They gave us seven names, and we had seven days to find everyone we could within seven generations. So seven degrees means seven steps in any direction. On Wikitree, we call that count a person CC7. Our starting people were William M Miller Boyd, uh, born in Northern Ireland, and his connections increased 718. Next, we had Harry Ferguson, his connected 505. We had Seamus Haney, his uh, increased 255. John Wilson Kyle, we added 302 connections to him. Robert William Moore, also known as Gary Moore, we added 309. William James Peary, we added 865. There was a lot of activity on his branches. And then Ruby Florence Murray, known as Ruby Lamar, we added 366. Now, Anne, I'm going to go ahead and ask you um, how you chose your seven starting people and to tell us a little bit about your organization. Right. Well, we, we had a look across the board at uh, what might be regarded as famous people or notables that were kind of born or had um, very strong connections with um, Northern Ireland. And we also wanted to get a little bit of diversity. So we wanted to kind of get males, female um, from different classes and so on. So um, we looked, we, we had started off with a list of about 20 people and then we kind of came down to the to the seven that we selected um, and we thought that they would go, give a kind of good challenge uh, to the participants. Um, I think probably most of us know that Irish research can definitely be challenging, um, but we also felt that there would be, knowing um, the Northern Irish um, and the Irish in general, uh, they travel all over the world and we knew that they that probably um, at varying degrees from these people, there would be um, relatives that had traveled to 
um, the States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, wherever, and would um, provide uh, a good uh, sources for people that are researching in wherever they may be. And that certainly, I think, proved the case. The, the North of Ireland Family History Society, we, um, as the name implies, um, we promote um, research of um, Northern Irish families. Um, and uh, we, but also recognizing that we support um, people locally that are researching no matter where they where they are located. Um, we have a research centre just outside of Belfast, and we have a really good library there um, that um, provides really good, um, probably in many cases more obscure um, resources that might be than might be available online um, that allow people to research um, their family history. We are very much into um, training and we run a whole series of courses uh, through um, the right throughout the year. Um, we also have a strong focus on DNA and we run an overall arch, uh, an overarching project for the, um, the North of Ireland. But then more recently, we've been getting into very local projects um, and the main ones that we started with were the Ballycarry DNA project and the Island McGee DNA project. And both of those, we are using Wikitree um, to record our findings. All of the participants in those projects, um, we put um, their family histories onto Wikitree. And it's an ideal platform to show all of the connections um, between the various families and therefore help um, the participants in the analysis of their DNA. We have uh, 10 branches right across the north of Ireland and uh, they will run physical meetings, but through, the, um, through COVID, they really got into online meetings. And so we ended up with a lot of new members right across the world and that has really rejuvenated um the the society i would say um it's been really great to see the number of participants so at the moment we're kind of um all of us are kind of trying to ensure that um our members no matter where they may be located um can easily participate uh, in the um the work of this, the society and so we're having um, hybrid meetings or online meetings. And I think that is working really well. Yeah. And I know you and I have had a, a chance to chat quite a bit since we started working together. And, you know, the activities and the outreach of you and your group are just really impressive and really inspiring. And so um, we love to work with people like you that are just getting out there in the community and, you know, helping people to, um, to realize that this is important, uh, you know, documenting us and our ancestors and finding out for sure where we all came from. Yes, no, um, I think we've got, we, we have, as I say, of, you know, a very active um, membership and it's great to see, you know, how they can, they, they can work together. Uh, and uh, it's, um, Ireland, it's our, the north of Ireland, it's kind of quite a, a small place, but um, in, in many ways that has advantages because there's an element of, you know, people um, knowing each other. And um, we find often, particularly in our, we run a DNA interest group, and what we find is that many um, of our members are, uh, find that they are DNA matches with each other. And that's um, great to see. And then they can literally um, collaborate uh, to see where the connection is. So it, it really adds to the whole um, uh, area of, of analyzing your DNA. Here we have a few of our top people during the challenge week. Martin McDowell, who was our most valuable participant or MVP. Maureen Ahern of New Zealand was our top bounty hunter. 
and Donna, the team captain for this week, um, did just a fantastic. So yeah, I was job. looking at beginning numbers, and at the beginning, we only had six hundred and eleven people in the CC seven for these um, starting profiles. At the end, we had almost four thousand. So we created, wow. we added thirty four hundred to the CC sevens. Um, 2,000 of those were manual one by ones. We, we weren't, we made quite a few connections, yeah. but two thirds of the profiles that were added in the CC7 were us adding one profile by profile and about 1,100 were added for connecting to other profiles. But it takes an entire team to collaborate and come up with outstanding results. We had more than 72 people participate in an incredible show of collaboration. We took a look at all of our starting ancestors. We didn't find a blood relation, but we did find some cousin connections. Stephen Boyd and Gary Moore were connected within 21 degrees. Next was William Peary to Harry Ferguson, which was 22 degrees. And finally, William is also 24 degrees from John Kyle. We have a lot of fun using the connection finder during the week to see who we're closest to. So this is Donna's uh, connection to Henry George Ferguson. It shows you the path used to reach him with five different com connections being by marriage. Now, sometimes that's less, sometimes that's, that's more. Here we have another connection. Seamus Haney was a Nobel Prize laureate poet. He's widely recognized as one of the major poets of the 20th century. Now, 16 degrees from him is Geordie Barnett, who is an Irish historian, archaeologist, botanist, geologist, folklorist, but also a poet. He's best known for his discovery of the Baymar stone circles, and he developed the theory that they were an ancient lunar observatory. The theory was expressed in his poem, The Baymar Stone Circles. While looking at the connections, we checked into Right Reverend Dr. Simon Digby, an Irish bishop. Now, he was a gentleman of the Bristol family, and his father was a bishop of Drummore. He was a great master of painting in little watercolors. Here are his connections to our starting people. Stephen Boyd at 14 degrees, Jack Kyle and William Peary at 17 degrees, Harry Ferguson at 20 degrees, Gary Moore at 23 degrees, Ruby Lamar at 24 degrees, and the furthest out was Seamus Haney at 26. We also looked at Abraham Lincoln, and you'll find out why um, shortly. And, you know, they say his greatest achievement was his ability to energize and mobilize the nation by appealing to its best ideals while acting with malice towards none in the pursuit of a more perfect, more just, and more enduring nation. No president in American history has ever faced a greater crisis, and no president has ever accomplished as much. His closest connection is William Peary at 12 degrees. Well, now let's go ahead and take a look at some other interesting finds and connections. And we'll start with William Miller, known as Stephen Boyd. He, of course, was an Irish actor actor who came to the acting stage as an adult. He appeared in about 60 films, mostly notably as Masala and Ben-Hur, which earned him the Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actor. Now, sometimes we just find interesting people along the way. Here was John Kenneth Tomlinson, and he may not have achieved what some would call a notable status, but his local newspapers found his family interesting enough. He was born in Wyoming in the United States, the middle of three children born to Herbert Tomlinson of Derbyshire, England, and his wife, Carolyn Carey Dunn. John was born in Rock Springs, Wyoming. As a boy, he was thrown from a horse, breaking his collarbone. He later worked as a maintenance foreman in Arabia for the Trans-Arabian Oil Company. He and his wife had three children, two of which lived to adulthood. His son, Kenneth John, or John Kenneth Jr., went into the military, and while he traveled extensively, he often returned home to visit his parents, and this was documented frequently. Uh, John Silva, or sorry, John Sr., had also been in the military handling ordnance. 
his daughter worked as a hairstylist and their family really was in the newspapers a lot. So, you know, it was, and it was interesting to see that there wasn't a whole lot. There was a lot about his son's uh, military career, but not as much about the elder John's military career. Now, he was honorably just discharged just short of his two-year mark with an unstated disability. So there was something that occurred before he finished. Uh, his only brother, Herbert, who was also in the Army, sustained more than one injury. And after re-enlisting when World War II was in full swing, Herbert received a Bronze Star for meritorious achievement and then a Purple Heart for his injuries in service. And, you know, he was in the paratroopers infantry. So really a strong military family. But it was fun to see all the clippings and stuff that popped up, you know, for people going and visiting grandma or, you know, which ones were seeing the sister and whatnot. And John Tomlinson Sr. and Stephen Boyd are six degrees uh, apart. And I want to take just a moment to thank uh, Cheryl Hess for working on this profile. She did a beautiful job on it. You know, we have some people that uh, like to come in after the fact and build these biographies off of the sources. And this, she just did a really beautiful job on that one. Um, and there's many others, of course. Now, next, we'll go to Harry Ferguson. He was born in County Down, Ireland. He became a mechanic and developed the three-point linkage system for the modern-day tractor. He was also the first person to build with his brother Joe and fly his own airplane in Ireland. So here we have an adventurous fella in his branches. On the 29th of May, 1953, Sir Edmund Percival Hillary and Sherpa Mountaineer Tenzing Norgay became the first climbers confirmed to have reached the summit of Mount Everest. Edmund, Derek Wright, and Murray Ellis arrived at the South Pole later on in their, on their um, Ferguson tractors. That was in 1958. They were the first to do so overland since 1912, and they were the first ones to reach it in motor vehicles. So just really fun to see the interesting people that pop up when you start this research. Now, Edmund Hillary and Harry Ferguson are 19 degrees apart. And so that chart um, shows the, the path from one to the other. Next, we have Seamus Haney, who is a Nobel Prize laureate poet. He's widely recognized as one of the major poets of the 20th century. Born the first of nine children, his father was a farmer and raised cattle. In 1957, he studied the English language and literature at the Queen's University in Belfast. During his time there, he found a copy of Ted Hughes' Lupercal, which inspired him to write poetry. And this took us to another one. Sometimes we just find unusual occupations as we delve into the branches. So here was Henry Doherty, and he was born in 1839 in County Londonderry, Ireland. He married Mary Fisher Doherty in 1862. In the 1911 census, age 72, he was a nailer, which was a maker of nails, and a widower. His son Charles, a railway porter, married Susanna Haney, which was Seamus Haney's grand aunt. So, you know, and I, I don't know if some people get as amused as me and some of the others do about finding um, occupations and stuff, but I had to go look this up and read about it. And, and you know, they're talking about how um, sometimes it would be like three or four of these nail makers, these nailers that would get together, but a lot of times it was families. And so they would make this room, they would designate this room or rent a little small little place um, to do this, you know, where they could have the, the foundry there and they could put up to six anvils around it, around the hot fire so that they could, you know, each pound and, um, Oh, they lost my train of thought there. <laughs> oh, and, you know, and so it was a family event. They just all gather, the kids and everything, and gather around here. Now, each one of those nails, they'd have to draw it out, clip it off. It took about 35 uh, hits for a really super nice nail, like for a horseshoe. 
and then only about 25 blows to the hammer uh, for a regular nail. And, you know, I mean, they'd say these people would just make thousands and thousands of nails, though. So you can imagine how, you know, difficult that must have been. They had some strong arms. I know they had strong arms. And, of course, this occupation was lost to automated processes or superseded by new uh, inventions. But I just found it interesting, you know, reading about these people. Um, we had another person that was a raker. And we had a great discussion on it uh, over the weekend. And we couldn't decide if, you know, it meant like a traditional rake or somebody that raked flax or <laughs> exactly what it was. So I didn't get to put them in here. Um, but it was a fun discussion talking about the, the occupations. And so Henry Doherty and Seamus Haney are five degrees to par apart. And you can see it's just that one uh, connection switches for marriage. Here we have John Kyle, another one of your starting people. He was an international rugby player and a surgeon. All of his siblings, apart from his younger sister Beatrice, were talented sports people. His sister Betty captained the Ireland uh, women's hockey team to triple crown success in 1950. His sister Brenda played hockey to the provincial level. And his brother Eric played rugby for Ulster and was an Ireland trialist. That's quite a quite a sports family there. Now, we often come across spelling variations while researching, and it's often hard to tell if the census taker, you know, uh, used the spelling he as he thought it should be, or if maybe there was an accent that was present that caused variances. But in the case of Alexander Warren, he was a Warren by birth. On the records for their first four daughters, however, the spelling had changed to wearing. For the fifth child, they wrote wearing and then crossed it out and said Warren. So we're not sure if the family was trying to change it or if they just finally realized that it was being said wrong all that time. I'm not sure. And then, of course, by the last two children, they had the correct spelling of Warren again, again, as did all of the other records. So, you know, one can only speculate why those changes occurred. But really interesting to, um, to see the changes tracked through the records. And Alexander Warren, of course, was the grandfather of John Kyle. So the next starting person we had was Robert William Gary Moore, who was a Northern Irish musician. Over the course of his career, he performed a range of music, including blues, blues rock, hard rock, heavy metal, and jazz fusion. He was often described as a virtuoso and has been cited as an influence by many other guitar players. In his branches, we found John Lowry. He was born about 1834 in County Antrim. He was the son of Hugh Lowry, a mariner. Like his father, John worked as a mariner or a sailor. He married Elizabeth Snotty at the age of 25, and they had at least six children, all but one being boys. Elizabeth's sister Mary also married a mariner who worked as a harbor master for many, many years. John continued to work as a sailor and was recorded as a sea captain. On their daughter Ellen's 1872 birth record, now, the sister Mary's son, Edward, worked as a ship's engineer. So the sea must have really run in their blood. You know, it was like in the family. They all wanted to be out on the, out on the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, Edward drowned at the age of 42. Now, John later worked as a boiler shop laborer and lived to the age of 78. But for the majority of his life, he spent his time out on the sea. John Lowry was Gary Moore's great-great-grandfather. Next, we have Canadian-born William James Peary, first Viscount Peary of Belfast. He was an Irish shipbuilder who was in charge of Harlan and Wool when the passenger liner Titanic was built. So I can see why one of your people picked this one. And this is anything to do with the Titanic is, um, you know, interesting to a lot of people. 
Now, when asked about whether there were sufficient life rafts on the Titanic prior to its fateful inaugural voyage, Peary replied that, the, oh, the ship was unsinkable and that the life rafts were there for rescuing others. His words would haunt him for the rest of his life. Co-worker and nephew, Edmund Thomas Andrews, was one of the many that died on the Titanic. Peary was also meant to be on that voyage, but took ill just prior to departure. Now, ironically, William died aboard the ship Ebro on a business trip to South America. Uh, cause of death was pneumonia. His body was returned to Ireland for burial in Belfast. So he didn't sink or anything, but, you know, he did have a, a delayed fate, I, I suppose, of dying on a ship later, much later in life. And out in the Peary branches, the researchers found so many interesting people on the Peary lines. It was super, super hard to choose. There were 19 different notable people out in his branches, as well as eight or more people that had unique events in their life that they, um, our researchers noted. So since I referenced Abraham Lincoln earlier, we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Harlow Barney. Now, he was born in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, one of 12 children. He married Amy Wolf at the age of 20. In 1849, he was involved in a civil suit. And it may be the one that we found that um, was from H.M. Barney regarding money uh, lost due to a fire and not being accountable. He took on Greenberry Lafayette Fort as counsel. Now, that was Fort's first briefing as a lawyer. Nobody really knew who he was, but he was able to continue on and win the case. And his opposing counsel was Abraham Lincoln. So Fort and Lincoln became fast friends over this case. And, you know, Fort continued on to become a politician in Illinois. And, you know, so thank you to Dr. Harlow Barney that was that was out there on Williams branches. Or who knows, uh, you know, how they would have met or if they would have. Now, Harlow Barney and William Peary are a mere six degrees apart, with one of the connections being by marriage. And then it was fun seeing an Australian. Well, we actually had a few Australian and New Zealand connections in William's branches. This was Sir James Allen, who was a prominent New Zealand politician and diplomat. He was born in Adelaide, Australia. He held a number of the most important political offices in the country, including Minister of Finance and Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was also New Zealand's Minister of Defense during World War I. Turns out that he's only seven degrees from William Peary. Now, two more notable connections are William Hugh Montgomery, CVE, and William John Alexander Montgomery. William Hugh was born in New Zealand and was a politician of the Liberal Party from the Canterbury religion. William John was a New Zealand politician from Little Rivers on Banks Peninsula and a merchant. In 1884, he became the fourth minister of education in New Zealand, and both of the Williams were only five degrees from William Peary, so that was fun. Next, we have Samuel Cunningham. He was born about 1768 in Cricketstone, Ireland. He was one of the 12 children of Samuel Cunningham Sr. and Mary Barber Cunningham. Samuel represented his family's Belfast-based linen business in the West Indies. Now, in 1796, he was in St. Vincent planning a trip home to Ireland. He was only 28 years old, but he had a premonition that he was going to die en route. So he wrote out his will. Now in it, he left generous, generous bequests for each of his parents, all of his siblings, and the poor in Calade Parish, as well as several other named individuals. And sure enough, Samuel was in a battle at sea when a French privateer attacked the ship he was on, the Portland Packet, which was running under the British flag. Samuel is said to have fought bravely with the seamen. 
He tried to fend off the attack and save the cargo, but he and the captain were shot and killed. Now, Samuel's buried on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean Sea. The ship eventually waited, made its way back to Ireland. His brother wrote a touching letter to his uncle informing him of the death. And it was just kind of cool that those items, you know, were located. I mean, that letter was written in 1797. And there's a transcription available to read. Now, this one, we didn't find the direct connection between them as the elder Sam Samuel Cunningham represented a brick wall that we did not have time to demolish this week. However, there's strong evidence that he and Archibald Montgomery are related, making the younger Samuel Cunningham and William Peary possible distant cousins. So our final starting person was Ruby Murray, a Northern Irish singer and one of the most popular singers in the British Isles in the 1950s. She had surgery done on her throat as a baby, which left her with a very husky voice. She made her debut at the tender age of 12. Now, sometimes we find that the occupations are likely to have been what brought the couples together. So here we found another Doherty, but this time it was off of Ru Ruby Lamar's branches. Ellen McCormick Doherty was, she was 23 years old, a spinster and a shirt maker residing on Bennett Street when she married Thomas Doherty. He was 25 years old, a bachelor and a tailor residing on William Street, son of William Doherty. Their children's names were Mary, Thomas, George, Sarah, Elizabeth, Thomas, Ellen, James, and two others we couldn't locate. But, you know, pretty, um, pretty common names. But just really interesting that, you know, she was a shirt maker and he was a tailor and they came together. So, but I don't know, that was a lot of William. So, you know, William was uh, residing on William Street, the son of William. And Ellen Doherty was Ruby Lamar's great grand aunt. So that was their connection. And then we always give a nod to the military, you know, whether we're for war or not. These uh, men gave their lives and, and were patriotic towards their countries. So here we just looked at the Great War or World War I. And we found the following. We have Cyril Gerard Hazelden, captain in the Royal Engineers, and the first husband of Jane Lawson, Ormrod, who died in France. James Patterson Ferguson was working in South Africa when he returned to Belfast, Ireland to re-enlist for World War I. His previous service was with the South Irish Horse until 1908. He was 34 years old and a motor engineer in 1915. We have Victor Stanley Ferguson was a motor mechanic who enlisted in Britain's Royal Navy for the duration of World War I. Thomas James Cleaver served as a private with the 1st Battalion, New Zealand Rifle Brigade. He was deployed overseas on the Western Front. He died from influenza and cerebrospinal meningitis in 1919 in France. We have Robert Frederick Cleaver, who served as a private with the 2nd Battalion Auckland Infantry. He was deployed overseas on the Western Front. He was diagnosed with TB in 1917 and was transported back to New Zealand a month later. Arnold Howard Munnis served at the Coast Artillery Corps during World War I. Six degrees from Ruby Lamar was SPR Frank Edmonds, who died from wounds while serving in Egypt. Oh, so I missed that. I would have had to add Egypt to our list of places. Um, Samuel Barber Combe was killed in action in France. He was a lieutenant in the North Irish Horse, uh, seven degrees from William Peary. So um, a lot of really, really brave souls. Now on WikiTree, we're all connected. We're all cousins connected by blood or marriage. And right now there are 29,011,491 cousins on WikiTree, alive or not. 
Our research this time was primarily focused on Northern Ireland, but by the end of the week, we'd, fought, we'd researched in the following locations. Canada, the Caribbean, England, Germany, India, Ireland, Lebanon, New Zealand, Scotland, South Africa, the United States, and Wales. And of course, our one uh, poor gentleman that was in Egypt. So, you know, they kind of wound up traveling all over, you know, looking all over at least for uh, these locations for records. If you have any questions about the presentation or Wikitree, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Wikitree.com. And then while the image credits play here, I just want to take a minute to thank all the incredible Wikitreeers that helped uh, with research this challenge week. More than 72 people worked on this challenge. They found an amazing amount of discoveries, and they were a really fun work to uh, group to work with. And I also like to congratulate and thank Donna Bowman for leading such a successful week as a captain, as well as, you know, thank Anne and your group for working with us this week. So how do you feel the challenge went um, in the end there, Anne? I thought it was really successful. Um, I would, first of all, I would like to thank um, Wikitree for, for hosting us, um, and allowing us to, to participate. But I would particularly as well like to thank the participants. Um, they did an incredible job. Um, I knew it was going to be a challenge because um, of the difficulties that there are in Irish research, but they really... Um, came to the fore and um, made really exciting um, discoveries and it was really great to see. Um, so I would like to genuinely thank thank all of the participants um, for their efforts. Well, we just have so much fun doing this and, you know, we feel like we get to give at least the gift of our research and what we find. Um, to others. But yeah, it was so fun to see the collaboration between everybody and communications and, you know, people that maybe thought they weren't going to be able to contribute a lot. And they came in and talked to others and went, oh, I can find these records. You know, I can find stuff on people. And, you know, th but that's what people have to do. They have to be afraid to, to step outside of their comfort zone, you know, get out of that box and go out and look in a new area and just see what you can find. So I'm always excited to see people kind of uh, moving into new arenas like that. And hopefully, you know, this helped a lot of our Wikitreeers, uh, you know, learn new resources from you and from the group on how to do Irish research in the future so that they can work on their own trees. Yes, no, I think, I think overall it was um, very successful, very enjoyable and very productive. Yes. And, you know, and you and the, and the group, I mean, you guys broke several records anyways. You know, we were worried that you and I, when we started, we're like, hmm, I wonder how much they'll find. Because uh, we know there's those gaps and, you know, in time for Ireland where it's kind of hard to find records. Um, but people just did an amazing job and they still got a lot of profiles added, uh, you know, and just did such an incredible job. Yes, and I think, I mean, it was really obvious to me as well, the whole kind of learning experience that there was, um, you know, right throughout, um, both in terms of, you know, how to research in Ireland, but also learning, you know, how, um, how to make the most of Wikitree. Um, yeah, yeah. And that was really important as well. Well, this has been a lot of fun, and Thank you again for joining me. And I hope you viewers out there will join me in the next Wikitree Challenge.